When studying military conflicts of the past, historians are often interested in campaigns and the fighting tactics involved, the combat techniques and the abilities of commanders. But war is not just about battles. To destroy the enemy, soldiers need weapons. Someone should make this weapon. It's necessary to manufacture ammunition and load all the equipment. The armies need to be dressed. They have to be fed and supported. War is very expensive. Ukraine is waging defensive warfare against the Russian Federation, its military might and defense budget. And logically, Ukraine's chances in any direct armed conflict are low. However, depriving the aggressor country of sources of income, the war can end by itself. You're watching the 50th episode of the film History of the War. In 2014, the Russian Federation committed an act of armed aggression against Ukraine. The war has now lasted for several years. We're hot on the trail of studying its course tracing the links between military operations, diplomacy, politics and the economy. We're trying to understand how it happened and, most importantly, why. Unlike classical warfare, economic confrontation can last for a long time. Back in 2014, the Russian leadership achieved the imposition of economic sanctions on Russia, which reduced the aggressor's income. However, each state has certain reserves and any significant cutting of the aggressor's military budget requires time. In order to buy time and not to be swept away by the superior forces of the enemy, Ukraine sought to lower the level of confrontation in the combat zone. One of the points stated in the Minsk Peace Agreement implied a so-called separation of the parties. This included creation of a security zone along the demarcation line and withdrawal of heavy weapons to a distance exceeding their firing range. Facing the intensification of economic sanctions, Putin signed the Minsk peace agreements. And on February 24, 2015, the so-called Army of Novorossiya announced the start of withdrawal of artillery and tanks. Under the terms of the agreement, the Ukrainian army began a similar withdrawal on February 26. The first day of spring was not a peaceful one. Militants declared that they completed their withdrawal of heavy weaponry, but the work of sabotage groups, mortar attacks and firing continued. For example, in the battle with an enemy reconnaissance group near the Butivka mine on March 1, a soldier of the 11th battalion, Artur Yarosh, was killed. The next day, the village of Pischevik saw the same battle. In exchanges of fire, three soldiers were killed and two were injured by terrorists. A soldier of the 24th Brigade was killed as a result of an anti-personnel mine near the 29th roadblock on the Bakhmut Highway. On March 2, the spokesman of the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, Vladislav Seleznyov, said that during the first year of the war, the Ukrainian army lost 968 armored vehicles. It was also noted that during this period, 1,541 soldiers died, including 58 dead and 328 wounded after the new Minsk agreements came into force on February the 15th. Seleznyov, as army representative, voiced the casualty figure without taking into account servicemen who were missing in action and the counts of their units. As of March the 2nd, the total number of war dead was 2,381. Any military operation has a purpose. The results of a mission to be performed show the effectiveness of troops. After the Battle of Dubaltseve, the war acquired a positional nature. Troops defended in the main. Battles and shelling were mostly worrying, but losses in these local battles were real. By launching an anti-tank guided missile on March 3rd in the village of Hranitna in Volnovakha district, pro-Russian militants destroyed a Ukrainian truck that was delivering food to a Ukrainian outpost. The driver of the 72nd Brigade was killed. On the night of 3rd to 4th March, the Avdiivka experienced a mortar attack. Adherents of the Russian world, or Ruski Mir, did not injure Ukrainian soldiers, but killed a local woman in her apartment. It's worth understanding that any ammunition or military property is worth money. 
The price of an anti-tank system shooting just once is equal to the value of a passenger car. Heavy truck vehicles can burn hundreds of liters of fuel a day. Given the complete absence of any economy activity in the so-called rebel republics, maintaining a hybrid army in addition to a regular one is costly enough for Russia. The humanitarian convoys sent constantly by Putin to Donbass were also costly for Russian taxpayers. Column number 41 crossed the border on March the 4th. 166 cars carried about 2,000 tons of various cargo. Traditionally, part of the trucks really carried humanitarian aid. Their unloading was widely covered by local and foreign journalists. The convoy consisted of 41 tank trucks with various fuel, agit prop and of course ammunition. Taking into account, considering the recent intense attack of the Baltseva by militants, it's logical that timely replenishment of their stocks was a matter of survival. There was a remarkable incident. Early on the morning of March the 4th, an accident took place in the Zasadka mine in Donetsk. Various estimates state that between 10 and 32 people were injured as a result of a methane explosion. The Ukrainian side appealed to the militants to assist with the rescue operation. However, the terrorists refused to have contact with the Ukrainian authorities or to provide access to specially trained rescuers. The Russian side used tragedy to increase its popularity among the local population. Despite unloading supposedly humanitarian food aid in Donetsk, Putin ordered the equipping of one more convoy. According to the Russian media, the 18th so-called emergency humanitarian convoy was intended exclusively for the families of the accident-affected miners. Another important point was that militants failed to deliver humanitarian aid from the 17th convoy. The vehicles were waiting to be unloaded and such a move would have been rational. But the named humanitarian cargo most likely had some sort of military purpose. So as to justify the funding they received, militants made it impossible for Ukrainian troops to move forward. They literally identified weaknesses in the Ukrainian defense. Besides, when the terrorists declared the complete withdrawal of heavy weaponry, they would often put it back after OSCE inspectors had left. Despite the declared truce, militants constantly undertook sabotage attacks against Ukrainian positions. So on March the 4th, in the Svitlodarsk bulge near the village of Luhanske, a soldier of the 30th Brigade was killed after firing by an infantry fighting vehicle. According to statutes, even in ceasefire mode, Ukrainian soldiers have the right to return fire. Any aggressive actions by militants were resisted as harshly as possible, and the use of forces and means were appropriate to the threats the Ukrainian side faced. So on March the 7th, militants re-emerged in Shirokina. Attacking Ukrainian positions, terrorists used armored vehicles that were supposedly part of the rear. This led to the death of a soldier of the Donbass battalion as a result of tank fire. In response, a Ukrainian tank destroyed an enemy infantry fighting vehicle. The attack was rebuffed. On the same day, the emergency humanitarian convoy promised by Putin entered Donetsk. There were 20 vehicles containing aid for those affected by the accident at the Zasyatko mine. Logically, delivery was aimed at promoting the Russian Tsar's care of ordinary people. It contained no weapons. Despite the work of the OSCE and increased attention from foreign journalists, militants didn't withdraw heavy weaponry from the demarcation line. Quite often, there was merely imitation of such redeployment, and the weaponry was then redeployed to another front line. The terrorists returned to the shoot and scoot technique of wandering artillery batteries. On March the 9th, terrorists again attacked Ukrainian positions in Shirokina, using 120mm rear-based mortars. Four Ukrainian soldiers were wounded as a result of the attack. On the same day, a soldier of the 25th Brigade was killed near Avdiivka. 
Despite reducing activity, the truce was not respected. On March the 9th, the Defense Ministry spokesman on the anti-terrorist operation Andrei Lysenko said at a press briefing that Ukraine could not leave the front line in Donbass exposed under the withdrawal of heavy weapons agreed in Minsk. A similar situation worked in the Kremlin's favor because it actually led to the failure of the Minsk agreements, which were not favorable for Russia. As a result, the withdrawal of artillery and tanks was delayed for six months. The process was not completed. Wandering tanks and mortars attacked Ukrainian soldiers. To counter such attacks, the area was mined. Breaches of the silence regime were documented and reported to the OSCE. The enemy was also involved in lane mines. On March the 10th, in Zlatoustivka of Olnovakha district, a soldier of the 1st Tank Brigade was killed by a mine. Near the village of Krimske, a multi-purpose light-armored towing vehicle was destroyed by an anti-tank mine and a Ukrainian soldier was killed. By the middle of 2015, the number of mines laid along the demarcation line was huge. According to various estimates, it will take from 10 to 20 years to clear the region of mines. In order to start clearing the area of mines, the war must first end. Silence was not respected on March the 11th either. As a result of shelling of Shirokin and Krimske, two Ukrainian soldiers were killed. The warmer spring weather turned fields and country roads into heavy ground. This made the use of weaponry harder. The village of Shirokin was shelled with grenade launchers on a daily basis. But militants didn't use tanks and heavy artillery. In the period of 11th to 14th March, five Ukrainian soldiers were injured and three were killed. On March the 13th, another of Putin's humanitarian convoys crossed the border of Ukraine. This time, according to the Russian media, the column went to Luhansk region and transported food and seeds for people affected by shelling. Interestingly, neither Altai, which suffered from recurring floods, nor Buryatia, which has seen forest fires and are both located in Siberia, received any aid from Moscow. On March the 16th, occupied Crimea celebrated the anniversary of the referendum on Crimea's accession to Russia. The self-declared Prime Minister of Crimea, Sergei Aksyonov, announced March the 16th to be a shorter working day and announced long folk festivals. Terrorist leader Alexander Zaharchenko once again declared his intention to seize all those settlements where the so-called referendum on the independence of the Donetsk People's Republic was held last year. According to him, only when these settlements have been seized will it be possible to cooperate with Ukraine. That same evening, militants tried to improve their positions in Avdiivka. Ukrainian troops repelled an attack from Yasinovate. Militants launched a total of 15 attacks on Ukrainian positions that night. Empty trucks of the latest humanitarian convoy returned to Russia and plundered. War-torn east of Ukraine saw its skies lit up with flashes. Hiding from OSCE observers, militants slowly started shelling at night. The war smoothly transformed and more and more often an oppressive silence hung over the demarcation line in the daytime. The citizens of the Russian Federation have paid three times. They bought tanks and guns which militants used to destroy Donbass. Then the Russians paid again for consolidating humanitarian aid, for construction materials and fuel, for supporting the invented republics. But that's not all with the costs. Fighting on all fronts, Ukraine could convince the world to avoid doing business with Russia. Sanctions, financial restrictions, war is very costly, aggression is three times as costly.